I don't I've never done this before. Do I just share my screen? Mm -hmm. You can click the green share screen button. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, let's see. And just make sure your mics are off so with when other people are presenting. That's about it. Okay. Uh, let me know if y'all can see. You're good. You're good. Y'all can see everything right here? Yes, sir. All right, sweet. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Danny, and uh, my group and I, Wasim and Christian, are going over overview of cybersecurity in the banking industry. So why did we choose our topic? Well, our motivation is that for all of us working, um, it's important that the integrity of the banking security is top notch, meaning that we don't want to wake up tomorrow and see zero dollars in our balance. You know, that's very, it's very important that, uh, that this sector of security is a uh, top notch. We want it to work all the time. No, absolutely no flaws. Uh, or else they become very expensive. So the objectives for our final project, one, we want to report on the different methods used to protect the bank's information. And two, we want to report on the different methods hackers use to infiltrate bank security. On the third, we want to discuss findings on what improvements are being made to protect the bank's information. So it's all pretty straightforward. So uh, different methods that uh, the banks use to protect the information. One is strong encryption. Um, it's important that data encryption is implemented to make sure that, uh, you know, no one can see customer assets, anyone from the outside. Um, but not just data encryption is implemented. Uh, it's also important to make sure that all secure communications from client and server is encrypted as well. Any digital asset, it doesn't matter if it's not viewed as important or not, needs to be encrypted. No chance of that leaking anywhere out. Um, so fraud protection software. So Bank of America uses a thing called Trusteer, which is like a fraud protection. It protects you from like key logging and phishing. And we'll go over that later. Um, this is all very broad. We haven't, we're not going to dive too deep into this. It's just a basic overview of everything that we want to talk about today. So, um, digital certificates, like the certificates in the Google browser, you want to make sure that, uh, your websites, you don't want to use a fake website to log in your bank information in. Like um, uh, Interest and VeriSign, they're third party web, they're third party companies that uh, that employ third party certificates. So that's pretty important as well. And last, uh, biometrics, like uh, facial recognition, recognition uh, fingerprint. Um, since we're moving more towards on the mobile side of things, it's very important that we can implement those in order to personify your account and make sure that nobody else can get into your account only but yourself. All right. And then Christian. Greetings, everyone. My name is Christian, and I'm going to be going over uh, the methods that cyber criminals utilize in order to get a hold of uh, your information, our information to uh, get any sort of monetary uh, or tangible compensation. So according to the uh, IC3, the, uh, which is the Internet Crime Complaint Center, a subdivision of the FBI, there has been an increasing trend over the years, uh, spe specifically from 2001 to, to present day on uh, cyber crimes on financial institutions, but especially on, on individuals. Um, and this has resulted in, in billions of dollars uh, lost. Um, one key factor that has fueled this number to go higher in the last two years is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So as we know, um, COVID-19, the pandemic, it has changed the uh, the way we do business, the way we interact among each other and uh, among public or private institutions. Um, these key factors, has, uh, like I said, fueled a, a surge in, in cyber attacks, especially on individuals. Um, the way this has affected that is because since everything is remote, online, over the phone, and there is a lot of uh, phishing um, inquires on individuals and, and, and especially on individuals, you know, institutions have a, a higher level of security towards that. But given that scenario, uh, 
I want to talk to you about uh, something, just a little, you know, sneak peek on, on what the 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 main, you know, deeper subject is. Uh, they, you know, cyber criminals they create a uh, an identity profile a puzzle, it's called a puzzle, which is that many many times the fraud doesn't happen all together all at once, uh, you know, in a single hit. Many times what occurs is that over the course of multiple multiple uh, phishing uh, emails, phone calls, cyber criminals are able to to get a hold of little pieces of information, and at the end, by gathering you know, a big amount of data, they're able to then impersonate that person to get to either do credit card, debit card frauds, um, loans, or, or even tax, fraud, uh, tax frauds. So the specific, my specific uh, focus for in this uh, subject is going to be the specifically to phishing, what techniques and what to look for when uh, or you know, for the hackers to, or cyber criminals to, to the way the angle of attack that they utilize to get a hold of these things. At the same time, my uh, focus implies on, on what to do and what not to do uh, when looking at these uh, situations. So moving forward to hello everyone. Oh, so the same. Um, I'm going to be talking about ways uh, that can improve cybersecurity towards financial institutions. Uh, there's honestly, there's a lot of ways that I've read, but I just picked what I think is important and actually makes sense. Uh, the first one is investment in strong endpoint security. And before I did any research on this one, I actually had to look up and see if ATM hijacking is still a thing. Like when was the last time there was an ATM hijacking? And apparently it's still a thing. The last time there was one was like two months ago, or some, something like that. Um, obviously we need like banks really try to avoid, they have a lot of money, but they also try to avoid putting that money into like, security. One other thing I'm going to talk about is AI, lack of using AI in banks. Like they're, they don't use it as much as they're supposed to. But uh, uh, obviously like investing in strong endpoint security is better credit card readers. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys use Apple Pay. When Apple Pay first started, it was only all you had to do was put your bank number and the CCIV and the date expiration and all that. And boom, you could use that card. And a lot of, a lot of stuff and like hacking happened to that with people stealing cards and just adding them to their phone and using it. And then like, ever since that happened now to have Apple pay, you have to actually log in your bank after you put your card number and details. Oh, uh, and then implementation and maintenance of AI and banking institution. The one really main reason why they don't implement AI in banks as much as they're supposed to is because it's 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 expensive. Like to maintain it is very expensive. Along with they have this fear with unemployment rate increasing when they implement AI, which I think, I mean, sure there is some truth to that, but there's there's also balance. You can balance both and you could make both work just like anything else. For example, Tesla, they're self-driving. The only reason why it's so good is because every Tesla out on the road is actually taking data every single road. Like when you're driving a Tesla, Tesla is taking data everywhere you go to make sure that they have a good map for when the full self-driving is out. That's, that, that's just practice. You practice AI and you make it good. And then also another thing is assessing risk management and controls for third parties. Banks, again, they don't like using, they have so much money, but they don't like investing their money into good stuff that would actually help them. So banks use a lot, they use a lot, they source a lot of third party companies. They use them for software, security, camera system, apps. There's, there's plenty of things they use third party companies for. And one thing banks usually get 
scam do it from third party companies and that that's all based on what research and what I've read and done from like sources uh, as they don't they don't invest in the third party properly when I mean invest I mean in like looking into doing their DD the due diligence their homework making sure that third party is good which is basically making sure their whatever algorithm they're using whether it was for apps software whatever it was it was good well uh, make sure they're like go back to their history of their activities and how they manage their entities and risk their like their cyber risk how they had them before if they had any history of that and so on and so forth so those are like the three main stuff that really caught my attention and like i said there's there's a lot there's like probably like 10 that i would i will t be talking about uh, on my project and now uh, that's that's for improving bank cybersecurity. And then we're gonna go into like the significance of why it's important. Like one really like it's it's money at the end of the day, it's your money you worked hard for it. It, it better be safe and secure. There's like there's sweat and tears into that money. There's no reason for just one thing to go bad for all that to go boom, done, it's done. So also we don't use cash as much these days. It's all either Venmo, especially with COVID and this pandemic, it's either Venmo, a tapless pay, cash app, and like cash is really not used as much. So with this all going into apps, software, and your phone, like it just makes it even worse. Cause like it just, that's literally all they need. Just a software will just take it down. It's all it takes. One little small software of malware. It's, it's, it's done. And uh, I'm going to push this and give it back to Christian to talk about the conclusion and our resources. Thanks for hearing. Yes. Yeah, so just to recap, the main focus of our project is going to be to provide a full perspective of where we stand as a, as a society in terms of the layers of security currently implemented to protect us from these uh, uh, trends in cyber crimes. Uh, the most commonly used techniques that the cyber criminals utilize to exploit um, individuals and the uh, vulner vulnerabilities of uh, institutions. And also ways to further better data and identity security on, on financial management systems. And most importantly, um, the key takeaway for you is, is how you can protect yourself and those close to you from this uh, uptrending threat. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions about the presentation? Um, I had a question. So the identity uh, profile puzzle, that's like a very extravagant identity theft technique, it sounds like, right? Is that what well, not really. I actually, uh, I, uh, one, one of the things I was going to go over, you know, more in depth on the actual final uh, uh -huh. paper is, the, is a couple of case studies regarding that. Uh, personally, my mother, she, she works uh, at a bank and uh, this, was, this was actually done and not too long ago in, in, you know, with, within her department where people were somebody or a group of people were calling um kind of asking something that looked kind of like not a threat or innocuous but at the end little by little they were able to get tiny pieces of information such as zip code um age and then if somehow some way from another source you're able to get something else like last four of your social uh i don't know uh, last couple of addresses where you lived that's that is uh, something that can compromise uh uh, the integrity of, of uh, you know, the protection for your account with a bank. Because when you call, I mean, when you call a, a financial institution and you try to uh, speak to them, hey, I want to increase the limit on my card, for example. Um, the, they always do like a identity check. But these mm -hmm. things, they usually, uh, they usually consist of, you know, last four years social, phone number associated with the account, your address, st state your full name, stuff like that. So, may my banking finan financial uh, 
the, the, the bank that I use, they actually have a pin that obviously will be kind of hard to get a hold of, but um, that's what the postal is about, is gathering information. And not, it doesn't necessarily have to be just from the bank or from that place that you're trying to exploit, but it can be from somewhere else uh, where there is a flow in place. And then you can utilize that, you know, you can kind of like uh, uh, cross utilize the, the data on, on somewhere else of, of your interest. Yeah, I see. Thanks for explaining that. That's interesting. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything else? Yeah, hit us, hit us with some questions. <laughs> you guys know the type of encryption that's going to be used? On what? On, on banking? Yeah, they like, do you know what they use? Yeah, it's, um, a, it's AES-256 right now. Yeah. Many, uh, I mean, just a trending instance. And there's many more, it's not just that one. But I haven't delved too deep into that. Um, yeah, but the, by the way, the 256 means like the, so like imagine like two, like two to the 256th power. And that it kind of like gives you a perspective of, of uh, how many possible combinations for the encryption key there is on, the, on, 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 on that. So that's why, I mean, the, the higher the number, you see it before it used to be like SSL 128, whatever it was, so it's two to the 128 encryption. So, so they, it's kind of a little bit easier to, to do, you know, and then um, they use, uh, I know cyber criminals use something called brute, uh, brute force, uh, uh, kind of like inference on, on, on like passwords and stuff where you have some sort of algorithm running, you know, doing many possible combinations. Obviously this can be mitigated with some sort of like password protection, you know, attempts to lock the account after so many tries. But uh, there's always a way to, <laughs> to get, you know, past that. Uh, hello. We do have to move on since we're a little bit over time. Oh yeah. Over 15 sure. minutes. Said, is the QC part of questions? the presentation? I thought we had an extra like, five because we, 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 have, we only have four groups. I think we could have an extra. If there's another question, I think we could do one more because yeah. we have time. Yeah, it's a total of 15 max question. I mean, 15 max minutes and then five minutes for Q&A at max. Okay, because I had mm, I see. Uh, one more question. Yeah, go for it, Alex. Yeah, uh, I was interested in how more about how AI plays a role in the protection of like credentials, like how, right. how is AI going to protect passwords or protect uh, account information more as opposed to um, previous methods that are being used? They're, they're, they're also more able to identify fraud in transactions also. So that's what they would implement them more towards fraud and money laundering because they can tell suspicious, when you train AI suspicious activity, it will tell and detect suspicious activity way faster than a human will. And also the humans are not, there's not like a person watching every, like every everyone's bank account to make sure there is no suspicious activity. like. It happens when a dispute is made, when a, it could be like tax from government that they tell and they have to go through bank logs and how much money this guy's making and depositing, and then they go through it. AI really cuts all that off. Once it happens, it'll detect it. And then it'll ping bankers, they'll go through it, whether it's right or wrong. That won't matter at first because that's the whole point of having AI practice just to make it to make it good, to make it like efficient and accurate. But again, I said, they don't do that because it's expensive. It's high maintenance to do all that. And uh, also here, uh, I was also reading this article is it also prevents cyber crimes. Uh, like they could put AI fraud detection systems where a cyber crime when, you know, it's all about time. When cyber crime happens, it's all time. You know, like when a bank goes down and you have people's money online, like time plays a big role in it. 
But say you have an AI based like fraud detection system, which is practiced and knows and like you, banks know how cyber crimes and fraud happen. All they got to do is train that AI and tell the AI of how it happens. And then they are able, AI is able to detect it way faster. And again, time is important. So it'll save them hella a lot of money and time if they could actually implement it like 100%. Like they do have it. It's not like they don't use it. It's just they don't use it as much and they don't implement it on as many things. Again, because of high cost and unemployment rate, basically, they have this thought of unemployment rate increasing when implementing a lot of AIs. I have, I have a concrete example I would like to add to that. Also, like, are you ever, uh, has your, have you ever traveled and then, like, travel, like, plus thousand miles or something like that, and then your car declines or something? This right. is, I mean, you might you might not think it about you might not think about it as, as AI, but but that's a, that's a simple algorithm because obviously there's no, no there's no one watching your account to see. Right. This part. So it's there, but yeah. they don't have it on a lot of things. Yeah, I know. I they know. definitely do use it. They do use AI for a lot of things. I but they could it, it could be implemented. It's, it's, it's time to move on, guys. Yeah, we have to move on. It's time to move on. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, now my group is going to go next. Sounds good. Good afternoon. Our team is Geek Squad, and our team members are Rohanna, Marco, and Kieran. Today we'll be talking about network security infrastructure. Next slide, please. As more people gain access to internet capabilities, this only widens the pool of people that can be exposed to cyber attacks. We'll focus on large scale corporations in our literature review. We were inspired via the pipeline cyber attacks as it made us consider the makeup of network security and also explore possible solutions to prevent similar events. We could see that these impacts were widespread through the United States. Gas prices skyrocketed due to the shortages in the supplies. Also, I'd like to quickly introduce do some other side effects of cyber attacks. We have compromised personal data, money being stolen from accounts, and possible ransom scenarios. Next slide, please. We touched briefly on data breaches and compromised data, but we'll also explore right now why it's so significant. Data breaches can risk information on both the client and the user side, and this may lead to personal information such as social security, birthday, and other sensitive information being leaked. In terms of a larger scale, companies might have information about projects, strategies, and other things leaked into a public forum, and that can put the project's integrity at risk. Next slide, please. There are many types of cyber attacks, but we'll only be focusing on the three that we think are the most common. I'll be talking about denial of service, Mark will be talking about phishing and Kieran will be talking about ransomware. We hope to find that these attacks happen due to a similar weakness in the infrastructure of the network. That way our solution can be broad reaching and not only apply to one type of attack. I'll hand it over to Kieran. She'll talk about problems and also our objective. Hey guys, so I'm gonna be talking about four different types of problems that we found synonymous with these types of attacks. So, we're talking about this on a business scale. So the first problem is a lack of high level, high, lack of high level strategy. And this occurs when a business, is, a business doesn't really have a good strategy in place for their cybersecurity needs. And this can be caused by a lack of funding. They don't think it's a big problem or they may already have a strategy in place, but it's not combating the issues that um, they want to combat. The next issue is an unsecured network. So if you access a unsecure Wi-Fi network, this gives, a hacker, this gives a hacker a gateway to access everything, all the systems that are connected on that network. And this can lead to a lot of data on the business side and on the user side to be potentially compromised. Another issue is that 
uh, some businesses might have outdated systems. And if these systems are no longer able to receive software updates with patches that can help mitigate against new and evolving cyber attacks, these systems are more susceptible to cyber attacks. And our last problem is a lack of monitoring. So if we have not a good monitoring system for what's going in and out of the network traffic, and there's no alerts to see if something uh, like an attack or something is happening, this causes the business once again to be more vulnerable to cyber attacks. Next slide, please. Now that we've given an overview of the issue at hand, each of us will go over a type of cyber attack further on in the presentation. And afterwards, we will provide an innovative solution to help mitigate these attacks. Next slide. Okay, my name is Marco and here we're gonna go over the preliminary literature review, uh, which will cover three most common types of attacks that we just talked about, which includes phishing, denial of service, and ransomware. Uh, looking into uh, phishing attacks, here basically, here basically uh, starting, uh, starting from phishing attacks, this is a type of social engineering attack that preys into the victim's psychology via deception. Through oh, math. Math. oh my bad. <laughs> Through, uh, through masquerading, uh, through masquerading uh, as a legitimate source, this phishing attack can come in uh, can come in as a as a as a normal looking message that will ask you for credentials, install software, or contain malicious uh, links. Uh, the phishing comes in different forms of communications, normally that are like um, that are common common towards us, such as texting, uh, emails, or social media messages through. Um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and so on and so forth. Now we're going to head into the denial of service. With denial of service, it hinders the access of legitimate users as it targets the system and overflows the resources. We'll be talking about how the internet structure allows this to happen as the reduced complexity leads to less security. We'll also talk about how IPF spoofing allows for the attackers to take on the IP address of legitimate users onto ransomware. So giving a little background on ransomware, this is malware that encrypts a user's files on their system and holds the data against them. And the only way to get this data back is if the user pays a ransom to the hacker to get an unlock key. So this is usually caused if uh, a user might accidentally use a fake ap application that appears to be non-fraudulent. They accidentally or they may purposely click on a email spam link or they might access it, they might unintentionally access a unsecured Wi-Fi network. Next slide. Well, here in our, on our proposed solution, we focus on the onto the technological technological demands. As we all noticed after the pandemic, we saw a large shift into the telecom telecommuting, uh, which of course brings a new rapid demand on, on our current infrastructure. One possibility will be to uh, to use uh, quantum computing in reference to uh, mitigate these uh, these this attacks. This type of computer uses qubits rather than bits, and these properties allow quantum computers to move information around and perform tasks quicker and more efficiently than ordinary computers. Therefore, the possibilities of quantum computing are therefore endless. Additionally, scientists will use the quantum computing to take artificial intelligence to new heights. Well, in the area of security, we can see that this tool can bring its own set of pros and cons shown below. As we just talked about, it can move information around much quicker than ordinary computers, and it can take AI to new heights, which of course will let us, uh, let us, view, um, let us view into new trends that might pop up in the future. Then again, the cons will be that, uh, quant as mentioned, that um, quantum computers can um, can become available to the general public, and this can bring new challenges such as making making the present day encryption obsolete. So uh, we have come up with a schedule into uh, into into uh, into our work. As you can see here, we have three phases. The first phase will be research the material. And here, we're just gonna focus on research, researching uh, valid sources. Then on phase two, we'll, we'll create our first draft of, of both the paper presentation. And lastly, on phase three, we'll, our, final, our final phase, we'll make our final adjustments to both the presentation and the paper. 
just to summarize, we've talked about why we think our topic is important, why it's important to explore network infrastructure. We've also talked about the three main topics we'll be covering, such as phishing, ransomware, and denial of service. And we've also proposed a important top solution to this, which is quantum computing. This now concludes our presentation. If you guys have any questions, let us know. Thank you. I have a question. Um, what are ways to mitigate um, denial of service uh, trips? Say again. Reducing denial of service threats. So through initial reading, we've come up with filtering or rate limiting. We've also got um, capability-based response, like the flow of congestion and things can prevent them from getting the resources all at once. That's just from our li initial literature review readings. Okay, but what about, but that's kind of like, uh, uh, focusing towards like overflow of uh, page requests, for example, for some sort of a uh, service online, right? Like imagine you were able to like break down a script that can like do like infinity page requests to this page and then it just overflows the server and it just goes to hell, right? But, but what about if some cyber criminal is able to like get a hold, like infiltrate, and then he was able to, um, somehow some way manipulate the, da the data to make it unaccessible for customers or um you know the actual employees of, of that company then what, what are ways to meet you know any ways of mitigating that obviously you know we're just briefly getting into the topic i think researching the mitigation and those processes more would come into our like actual literature review we've only looked at it like those two reasons I gave you above, we don't have anything in that depth yet. So in terms of the proposal, that's all I can share right now. Okay, no problem. I just wanted to try to expand my knowledge. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the quantum computing aspect. So um, let's say attackers get these quantum computers. Can't they make the problem worse? Like. Would you have to like fight against each other? How, how would you guys maybe think that would work? I know you guys haven't researched this, but maybe any thoughts on what if these two quantum computers fought at each other? Right, right, right. So like, this is basically, it's gonna, it's gonna be like the new race. Like uh, since we first got like, this is like um, going back into the, like in the early 2000s when there was like a, a huge bubble in, in, um, in tech basically that in, when internet became more, mostly available to everybody, that's, I believe this is going to be the it's going to be yet another uh, checkpoint that this will happen yet again. So what we're like what I've looked into is how to how to stay ahead uh, with um, I read into uh, how to stay ahead with uh, how do you call this um, uh, proprietary technology. Unfortunately, you know proprietary technology can be good and be beneficial towards uh, the actual the actual owner, but not to everybody else. But that's going to be one way to maintain the edge for a quantum computer. So like. Uh, just having something like the way something is done be proprietary to someone so nobody else can see it. But that is just, well, one method among others in order to stay ahead of uh, well, ahead of the game here, because yes, eventually this will, will come up. And I guess I, I will, I will say that it will eventually level itself off like we're at right now. Like just not, let's not take quantum computing into consideration just with a level of competing. So we're looking into that, that's something that will eventually happen in the future as well. But I believe that this is gonna happen. Uh, the big corporations that have the money to fund this kind of research are gonna have the edge first. And then eventually it's gonna, everybody's gonna follow. That's what you're saying. Thanks, Marco. No problem. Anything else? Guys, want okay. to move on to the next one? Uh, we can move on. All right. Let me share my screen one second. Okay. Um, right here. All right. Did you guys see these slides? All right. 
Yeah. All right, cool. Let me move this Zoom thing. Uh, one second, sorry. All right. Welcome to our presentation. Our topic is hardware security and memory technology. And my name is Adam Keller. And my name is Fernando Vieira. So some motivation on why we chose this topic. First, um, so like if you had a software security, um, not a software security issue, you could easily roll out an update, right? We constantly get brigaded with Windows updates to fix these um, vulnerability issues in code and whatever. And so that's easy for software, but for hardware, we have to completely um, redesign and rebuild it. You have to send it out to each customer. It's a lot harder than just sending out, um, rolling out a patch or sending out a Windows update. Can't do that with hardware. Um, also, row hammering is an interesting attack that we started to look into um, that we're going to talk about greater and later in the presentation. And of course, in our final report is going to be talked about greatly. Um, it's what really um, made me interested in picking hardware security and memory technology because it's just a very cool exploit that uses JavaScript and um, hardware to actually perform a pretty nasty attack. Um, it'd be really cool to see how to mitigate these security flaws um, to create a more secure piece of uh, memory technology. Yeah, not only that, also it's very, very um, <clears throat> innovative as well. When it comes to the hardware security, it all depends on the amount of layers you have from an RNG, which is a random number generator. And then the, depending on how many levels you have for that particular hardware device, that increases the chances of actually having extremely potent and formidable hardware security and mitigate the chance of an attacker invading and taking all your personal data from that particular hardware device. And also finding different um, methods of devices for defense mechanisms for these particular hardware devices. Um, we're gonna go more in depth as far as when it comes to hardware security modules and what devices to use or implement to increase the actual hardware security. So we have, there's multiple problems, of course, when it comes to hardware security, there is too many different attacks that there is, but we're gonna focus on these four. Um, the two that I'm focusing on is Meltdown and Spectre. So when it comes to Meltdown, it's actually an attack that exploits the out of order execution of a processor, primarily modern processors, and it reads the kernel memory and extracts vital information whether it's your personal data or passcodes, it literally goes inside the kernel memory in the processor and bypasses any type of security without any type of permission. And it completely obliterates your memory from beginning to the end. Now, when it comes to Spectre, Spectre is extremely similar to um, Meltdown. The main difference between the two is that Spectre can attack you in, in wide variety of ranges in which we're gonna dive more into it on the next coming slides. We also have Trojan attacks that specifically target SRAM chips, uh, static RAM chips, um, which can actually lead to read, write, or memory retention failures, um, or even information leakage. So you can't read or write from memory, which is, I mean, that's the whole use of it to put information there very fast and take it out very fast. Um, you can't do that anymore. Information could be leaked. The, if you have any passwords or cookies, whatever you're storing in there, it could just completely get leaked to the attacker. Um, so that's a huge security concern in um, memory. And also the row hammer attack smash that we talked about um, earlier. Smash is a synchronized many-sided row hammer attack utilizing JavaScript. There was actually an article done on March 15th, 2021. So this is a ongoing issue that is persistent. It's attacking DDR4 DRAM chips. Um, so this, is a, this isn't something that just happened a long time ago. This is happening today that's still affecting us. Um, it's a, a row hammer is a side channel attack that could lead to dangerous things such as bit flipping um, and bit flipping could actually lead to root access into systems. So you could have your whole um, um, system taken over by this row hammer attack. As far as when it comes to the outcome for this um, research that we're doing, what we want to learn from it is actually what makes Intel the processor prone to both meltdown and Spectre and as well as what separates these attacks from each other as far as what is common between the four and what is actually a solution that can benefit all four if there is some common consensus between the four as far as the different attacks. We also like to get from our research what vulnerabilities are present. Um, maybe they're all related, maybe not. If they are related, that'd be great. Um, so we wanna prevent um, against these smash attacks, the row hammer, um, 
specter meltdown um, to see these vulnerabilities that could hopefully be addressed and fixed. So some current works that we've been looking at, um, Rowhammer smash mitigation. So as we um, said earlier, um, study done in 2021, in that study, they said that DRAM technology actually seems to be getting worse with this Rowhammer attack. So we might have to take a different approach at mitigation. Um, and as well as actually when it comes to the meltdown memory, that the only defense mechanism that they have there's multiple articles of different types. Uh, there is one that we got very interested in that is called Kaiser defense mechanism. And what it does is that it utilizes a trampling function. We're gonna dive more into that on the presentation when it comes to the research. And when it comes to Spectre, there's multiple different ones as well. We are actually gonna go in and concentrate on Spectre Guard as well as Spec Fustaker, weird name, but they created it. Um, and go more in depth as far as the solution and to see if they actually have a common source, if they have a common way to defend against these type of attacks and preventing it from reoccurring if they actually consistently, the attacker wants to do this over and over again. So here's our little schedule that we have planned out. This week, we worked on the proposal and we presented. Next week, we're gonna gather info and research. We're gonna look into all these articles we just talked about, um, get more research on them, compile stuff. Week after that, we're gonna get a first draft going. And then after that, we're gonna work on our presentation and then our final draft. And then we're gonna research our presentation and then it's presentation week. So for the conclusion, pretty much our goal at hand is just to research and create a literature review on hardware security and memory technology that addresses all these security concerns from the attacks such as Rowhammer, Smash, um, melt, um, uh, Meltdown, Spectre, and the Trojan attacks in SRAM. Here's some references of the articles that we used. And do you guys have any questions? I have a question about the Rowhammer. Yeah. What, what's the worst case? Like, will it just make my DRAM chip like useless? Well, like I said, um, I could actually maybe go back to, actually I don't have it in the slides, but the Rowhammer attack could actually, so what it basically does from what my basic um, research is on it, you could target so like you have memory cells and you could target the memory cells right next to the memory cell that you want to target. So you keep on going, addressing them, addressing them, addressing them, you keep going on it and energy could actually start to leak from those capacitors and it could cause bit flips. And if bit flips happen, you could actually gain root access. You could take control of someone's whole computer from this attack. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty serious. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Yeah, and then uh, yeah, I got a question. Uh, so these uh, meltdown and Spectre, they, they uh, so they, they happen through software initially, right? Uh, yes, it happens through software initially, um, and as well as meltdown, they create a rogue application to send it directly to your computer. Spectre, the thing that makes it dangerous, they go, it, they can do it through the software, through the browser, and okay. destroy you through the browser itself. And do, do you know, do you have any information of what would happen? Uh, you ever heard about plunder vaulting? What was that? Plunder, plunder vaulting? vaulting? No, I haven't. No, I have not. Under, vo under vaulting is also another word. Under vaulting, under cool. What, what, what if you no, were no. able to get physical access to, to a computer and then do it from there? And then like there, there is, a, there is a, something called plunder vaulting. And then uh, by getting gaining physical access to the computer, you're going to um uh, you know uh, phys uh, physically affect the voltages in the in the cpu and also gain access that way well i'm not gonna act and say that i know exactly that particular attack itself by directly having in hand the computer itself and doing the particular um attack that you're trying to implement yourself as far as what you're saying um and to relate it to let's say specter and as well as meltdown um, the main reason why it's so dangerous is that the second that it is implemented, that memory completely is leaked and it goes, anything that is stored in that memory in that um, process is going to go directly to wherever the, whole, the attacker is located and it's going to leave you as a ghost. That's why the system, another system, the symbol of Spectre is basically like a ghost. 
a trolling ghost. <laughs> so that's basically what it would be. Your computer becomes basically dead. Um, and through that, they can actually um, practically shut down your computer. Your computer com completely becomes useless. That's what makes some um, hardware security very, um, very important in this case. Uh, hardware security, there's not that many defense against it because the second an attacker um, directly affects your hardware, your computer practically is gone. And you could technically relate it to like, let's say for an example, like a kind of like a credit card, you know how it has chips and it has like an encryption key. So nowadays you could use the tap. That's another form of an encryption key. So then if you, if for whatever reason you lose that card, you have sometimes seconds, you know, to cancel that card. If not, someone's going to use it and destroy it. Um, we can go as far as let's say Wireshark, for an example, like what the professor has been showing us. And I'm not going to say someone's smart enough to use a card, a credit card next to someone having a computer, <laughs> you know, and then they'll take your IP and then that's it, game over. They have your connection. They have all your transactions. They can just pretend to be you. So um, these attacks, as far as hardware security, they're very vital. But only thing is not that many defense are out there as of yet. That's what we're going to research and and give you guys more of a better answer as far as more in-depth answer as far as when it comes to these four topics we're going to try there's way too many out there any other questions all right thumbs up thanks so much guys um Thank next you. Uh, password encryption techniques you could go whenever you guys are ready uh, okay great um just let me share screen you're good here we go mm. no not that uh. we got the same thing that's funny yeah, you guys have good taste in, uh, <laughs> in layout. <laughs> um, all right, I just want to get recording on this end. Okay, um, welcome. Uh, this, present, this presentation is on password encryption techniques. Um, this will be both a literature review of different ways passwords are encrypted and potentially attacked, um, as well as a case study, which will be discussed uh, at a later point. Um, as kind of an example of how both passwords are encrypted and attacked. Um, as a preliminary, uh, I'll discuss some ways that passwords are encrypted and the most common ways that they're uh, hacked by, by hackers. Um, and for the purposes of this presentation, um, the main focus of the ways that passwords are going to be encrypted and attack are in ways that are meant to protect passwords from, um, from attackers that don't have direct uh, influence or communication with the victim. Um, this will be focused on, on kind of like third party, just foc um, not directly being associated. So like not phishing attempts per se, um, but other ways that um, just anybody can try to attack certain passwords. Um, the definition of encryption itself, which is a very broad term, typically involves a um, encryption algorithm that turns a password into a couple mess before it's transferred or sent to a database where it's then decrypted on the other end using a key um, and then referenced and checked before sending that personal data that is then encrypted on their end, sent back to you, decrypted, so forth. Um, one of the most common ways that passwords are encrypted is by using what's known as a hash function. Um, some popular functions are called SHA-256 and SHA-1. Um, and basically what those, um, what these functions do is that they take the plain text of the password. So, you know, say your, your plain text password that you put, that you enter into a website or a, your banking information is like one, two, three, four. Um, it's passed through this function and then based off of the function that it's used, it turns into 
a just a very very long string. It's a it's a fixed character length uh, based off of the function that it's used, um, but it turns it into just a random string so that when if somebody like per se uses a Wireshark or tries to see what information is being sent. Um, the hacker doesn't have any really val valuable information to go off of. Um, I'll discuss this in the ways that um, that passwords are attacked, but one thing that's that's used to kind of counter um, these hashing protocols um, is that uh, hackers will use a thing called a rainbow table, which will take like a huge table of commonly used function hashing functions. And they'll see if, uh, and they'll kind of reverse engineer the password and see if they can get something that looks like a password that somebody would use. And if they know that, and the thing is, if they know that hashing function, um, and if it's not salted, then they don't they don't just have your password. They have like everybody's password that uses that hashing function, like for for that particular for that particular thing. May it be a particular bank or a particular database that people use, which makes it very, very scary. Um, and salting is basically in, a, in addition to, uh, to hashing, you know, like, you know, salting hash browns. Uh, and it's basically when you put, you like sprinkle in just a little bit of random text that's used by a random number generator. Um, that's just kind of sprinkled into the hashing function. So that way, the garbled mess at the end of the hashing function is always unique and it makes it very hard for people to use um, those kind of reverse uh, engineering tables to, to figure it out because they won't be able to find that specific function um, that they're using. Um, these are the ways that the most common ways that attackers like independently attack databases and individual accounts of people. Um, it doesn't, all of them except for the key logging um, deals with, uh, deals with uh, not being directly interfaced with the, uh, with the victim. So brute force and, and dictionary are very similar. Um, it basically involves just a, an attacker brute forcing their way through, uh, through it by just it, typically, it's done through a piece of software that just constantly tries different combinations of um, of numbers and letters and just characters until they get something that works. Um, but these are are typically thwarted through like password attempts on a website um, or things of or things of that nature. And the dictionary attack can be can be countered by entering in special characters or things of that nature at the end of your passwords. Um, Rainbow table attack is what I discussed in the previous slide. Um, that's meant to you. Uh, that's meant to be used against just hashing functions if it's not salted, um, where they just try to reverse engineer the way that a certain password is hashed. Um, and again, like the, those can be very effective and can compromise entire databases and systems. So like when you you hear for you know the second time this week that like a huge database leak has happened. Um, that's kind of typically what happens. Someone like so some hacker got lucky and found a the hash function that's used throughout an entire database in a multitude of people's um, passwords and information are leaked out. Um, key logging I wanted to discuss a little bit because it is independent of um, of interfacing with the victim directly at, in phishing attempts, but it does require the victim to download a piece of it, uh, download a piece of information with some malware or with a software program on it. Um, and basically, what what key logging is is that it's a program that runs in the background of a victim's computer or or device and keeps a text a text file with all of the um, keystrokes that the victim does. And after a certain period of time, um, this file, this log is sent to the attacker. And then they can read and kind of infer um, like, okay, this person looked up um, their bank right here. So 
kind of goes to show that this and this is probably their username and password. And if it works, then they have direct access to, to either your login for information for your bank or anywhere else that you store sensitive information. Um, I will hand it off to Jocelyn for the next slide. Uh, it's really important to understand about encryption and description. Decryption, especially nowadays, since every information is stored online from uh, bank information, especially personal information from social medias. Uh, and we know that the only thing that protects our information simply is a password, aside from biometrics and like the fingerprints, because not all um, social media have that nowadays. Um, and to understand uh, how passwords are chosen, we need to also understand how um, how password should um, how passwords are being kept, which was briefly talked with by Alex. So when we log in or we create an account in a website, we do input our password and then like Alex mentioned, it's first converted by a hash function, which um, is specifically formulated by the website. And this password will be scrambled um, and stored by the receiver end or where they store all the data of all the user's password. And it can be decrypted to come uh, to show the password that we inputted. Um, and this is really important uh, to know so that from the client base, we know what type of password we should use and what examples of password we shouldn't use. So like um, there's a lot of different softwares that can prevent uh, hackers from hacking your password, but from the client base, it's really important to put password that's of course not common, common words or uh, uh, contains any information about your last name or your birthday or simple password like just numbers. And a good example of password would be uh, using an acronym like shown in the presentation, the PWRD for account Facebook, which is just an acronym for password for Facebook, which is really simple. Or just simply using those um, bad examples of password that maybe you've used and adding in, and incorporating more shortcuts just so that the hackers have more difficult time trying to crack or guess your password. Next slide. Um, oh. oh, sorry. Um, as discussed by Alex again, that we talked about how passwords are being attacked um, and the four, four attack methods that we're going to discuss would be the brute force attack, the dictionary attack, the rainbow table attack, and a little bit about the keylogger. Um, an old way of cracking password involves um, the hacker momentarily disconnecting a connected uh, device from the network and basically trying to access that weak point to access encrypted password or data that was already kept in the website. And this is done by sending packets. Um, and when these authorized users are being momentarily disconnected, um, this process is called like jamming network. And it is um, more difficult for the hacker to hack <clears throat> password just because as soon as the author, uh, uh, authorized user gets connected and they did they get disconnected they're more easily they easily detect like there there is a user trying to infrastructure the network because they get disconnected therefore since the technology nowadays are improving rapidly uh, hackers now use different types of software such as hashcats or hex tool to crack password the hashcat software it helps um, hackers find network that contains weak password easily. And for the hex tool, it captures information that uh, from a network so that the hacker can use boost forwarding to, in, um, to uh, access weak points. Um, and as discussed uh, from the previous slide that I said, um, one of the objectives that can be simply improved from the client space would be just improving um, 
making better choices in um, picking the password. So turning all your bad password into good password. And of course, like some preventions would be not writing down your password or not sharing these passwords because these are confidential to you yourself. And maybe simply downloading a software or any uh, apps that can um, use a password manager. Now I'm gonna give it to Brian. All right, so I, uh, I work with a guy named Frank Chetro. He has a master's degree in cybersecurity engineering from USF. He wrote these two programs that show the, the first one is the Code Cracker program. It shows the ease of how somebody can get your TCP report and then therefore monitor any keystrokes that you make after logging into that website. And then it does an algorithm to determine what your password is. So the solution to this to uh, stop this is to create a password manager program. And what it does is it's a third party software that sits on your computer. You log into it. It is AES-256 encrypted just for that password alone. Then once you've logged into it, you create your account, you get in, you will then add anything you want. Like if you want your bank account, your email, anyone, it adds it into it and it creates a specific password for that particular site. And that type of encryption is done by SHA-256 with SALT added into it. The SALT is basically there to prevent collisions happening inside the password algorithm as it's making it. Uh, this software allows you to, say you delete an email, you can remove it. So therefore, uh, it's no longer on the system because it is very limited at this now. This is the newer type of software that has been created. He's still developing it uh, as we speak. Next slide. So this is our schedule that we've set up. So as we're doing the proposal with research material right now, then we're gonna start working on our first draft, finalize our presentation, and then present all of our documents toward the end of the, end of the semester. So in conclusion, we've talked about we have encryption techniques. We have methods of attack that we can use. Uh, that will show how everybody can get there. And then uh, programs, the program, two programs that we had to prevent that basically enforce what we were talking about earlier. And those are the references. Um, we can take questions now. Um, and thank you for listening. So on password encryption, um, I know you talked about SHA-256 and SHA-1. I actually used SHA-256 for a project recently. I was curious on if you guys know anything and what's the differences between those two. Um, they both use the same, um, the same basic uh, way of going about, about it. Um, it's a, it's a little it's just got a little nuance the difference between them that um, I'll actually look into a bit more um, as the project goes forward, um, but they both essentially perform the the same action um, to varying degrees of security. I hear you. Thanks. Does anyone else have a question? Because I actually have another one. Yeah, sure. You can go, go ahead, ahead, man. Um, for, the for the password code cracker program that Frank was working on. So the password manager is to mitigate those key logger strokes, right? Yes. Okay, cool. That's awesome. You have like a URL or something I can download that program from? Uh, I would actually have to get the program from him, but he did state uh, if anybody is interested, he can get it set up. That was actually also in his final presentation on one of his slides uh, that if anybody wanted it, he would gladly give it because he wants, he wants everybody to have it. He's really passionate about this. I spent maybe eight hours at my work, me and him talking about different forms of cybersecurity. Nice. Okay. Anyone else have questions?
All right. I think all the presenters did well. A round of applause. Good job, guys. Everyone. Yay. Great job, guys. All right. Thank so you, everyone. I think we could go to the regular room to get um, it checked off. Are we going to? I'm going to stop my recording. Yeah. Then.